Today is December 5th, 2023, and my guest is psychologist and author Paul Bloom of the University of Toronto. This is Paul's fifth appearance on Econ Talk, last year in February of this year, talking about his book, Psych. Paul, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Our topic for today is a recent piece you did in The New Yorker, How Moral Can AI Really Be? And it raises a a raft of interesting questions and some answers, uh, but it raises them in a way that's different, I think, than the standard issues that have been raised in this area. The standard issues are, is it going to destroy us or not? Uh, that would be one level of morality. Is it going to destroy human beings? Uh, but you're interested in a subtler question, but I suspect we'll we'll talk about both. Um, what what does that title mean? How moral can AI be? What, what did you What did you have in mind? So I have a, a Substack which came out this morning, which talks about the article and expands on it, and has an even blunter title, which I'm willing to to buy into, which is uh, "We Don't Want Moral AI." And and um, and so the question is just just to take things back a bit. A lot of people are worried AI will kill us all. Some people think that that's ridiculous you know, science fiction gone amok. But even the people who who think it's ridiculous think AI has the potential to do some harm. Everything from, you know, massive unemployment to, to spreading fake news to, you know, creating pathogens that evil people tell it to. So everybody has a little bit of worry about AI. And there's different solutions on the board. And one solution as well, and this is this is proposed by uh, Norbert Wiener, the, the, the cyberneticist, um, I think uh, like 60 years ago, says, well, what if we make its values align with ours? So just like we know doing something is wrong, it'll know and it won't do it. And um, and this has been known uh, from Stuart Russell as the alignment problem, build build uh, AIs that have our morality, or if you want to put morality in quotes, because you know you and I, I think, have similar skepticism about what these machines really know and whether they understand anything, but something like morality. And I find alignment research in some way. My 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 article is like a love letter to it. This is this is the field I should have gone into if it, if it was around when I was younger. I have a I have a student, uh, Gracie Reinecke, who's who's in that area and sometimes gives me some advice on it, and I envy her. She says like going to. And you know, worked in deep mind and hanging out with those people. And it's just, um, and, you know, maybe, and so I'm interested in it. And I'm also interested in the limits of alignment. How well can we align are these machines? What, what does it mean to be aligned? Because one thing I point out, and not the first, is to be aligned with morality that you and I probably have means it's not aligned with other moralities. So, and, you know, so in some way, there's no such thing as alignment. It's like build a machine that wants what people want. Well, people want different things. Yeah, that's, and, a, uh, that's a simple but profound insight. And it, it does strike at the heart of what the deep, so-called deep thinkers are, are, are grappling with. I, I want to back up a second. I, I wanted to talk about the, um, the Norbert Wiener quote, actually, that you just paraphrased. He said, uh, we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. And I just want to raise the question, isn't that kind of a contradiction? <laughs> I mean, if, if you're really afraid it's going to have a mind of its own, isn't it kind of bizarre to think that you could tell it what to do? Yeah. It doesn't work with kids that well. I don't know about you, but... <laughs> You know, there, there was a there was a joke on Twitter. I don't want to make fun of my my Yale University president Peter Salovey, who um who is a, a, a very decent and and warm and funny guy. But he made a speech to the to the freshmen saying, "We want you to ex express yourself and express your views and, and give free reign to your intellect." And then the the joke went a couple of months later. He's saying, "Well, not like that," <laughs> and and um and. I think it's it's what we want is we want these machines to to be smart enough to liberate us from decisions. Something as simple as a self-driving car. I want to you know I want it to take me to work, and I can I just sitting in back reading or or napping. So I want to lib have it liberated, but at the same time, I want only to make decisions that I would have made. And that's maybe easy enough in a self-driving car case, but what in cases where I want the machine to be in some sense smarter than me? And that says, it does set up real paradoxes. 
to me, it's a misunderstanding of what intelligence is. And I think we probably disagree on this, so you can um, push back. The idea that smarter people make more ethical decisions, I, I, listeners probably remember, I'm not a big fan of that argument. It doesn't resonate with me, and I'm not sure you could prove it. But isn't that part of what we think we're going to get from AI, which strikes me again as kind of foolish? Oh, I don't know what the right thing to do is here, so I'll ask. I mean, would you ever ask someone smarter than you for what the right thing to do is? Not the right thing to achieve your goal, but the right thing that a good human being should do. Do you turn to smarter people when you when you struggle? I mean, I understand you don't want to ask a, a person who has limited mental capability, but would you use IQ as your measure of who would make the best moral decision? You're raising like 15 different issues. Let me, let me just quickly. Um, I do think that just as a matter of brute fact, there's a relationship between intelligence and morality. I think in part because people with higher intelligences, smarter people can see a broader view and have a bit more sensitivity to things of mutually mutual benefit. You know, if I'm, if I'm not so bright and you have something I want, maybe I could only imagine grabbing from you. But as I get smarter, I could engage, I could become an economist and engage in trade and mutual benefit and so on. Maybe not becoming nicer in a more abstract sense, but at least behaving in a way that that's sort of more optimal. So I think there's some relationship. But I do agree with your point, and, and maybe I don't think you could push back on this, but the, the definition of intelligence, which always struck me as best, is a capacity to, to, um, to achieve one's goals. And you want to kind of jazz it up and achieve one's goals across a different range of, of context. So if you could go out and, and you know, teach a, a university lecture and then cook a meal and then, you know, handle, you know, 14, you know, boisterous five-year-olds and then, you know, and then do this and do that, you're smart. That's <laughs> your smart. And if you're a machine, you're a smart machine. But, I, and I think there's a relation between that smartness and that morality. Um, but I agree with your main point. Being smart doesn't make you moral. And, and, you know, we will both be familiar with this from, from Smith and from Hume, who both recognized that, um, you know, Hume most famously, that you could be really, really, really smart and, you know, not care at all about people, not care at all about goodness, not care. Wanna, you could be a, a brilliant sadist. There's nothing contradictory. You have an enormous intelligence and you use it for the goal of making people's lives miserable. And so I think, and that's, of course, that's part of the problem with AI. You, you, if we could ratchet up its intelligence, whatever that means, it doesn't mean it's going to come nicer and nicer. And I, um, and so, yeah, I do, I do, I do accept that. I think intelligence is in some sense a tool allowing us to achieve our goals. What our goals are comes from a different source. And I think that yeah. that often comes from compassion, kindness, love, sentiments, but don't reduce to intelligence. How much of it comes from education in your mind? At one point, um, you talk about uh, we, we should create machines. You say we should create machines that know as humans do that it's wrong to foment hatred over social media or turn everyone into paper clips. The latter being a famous uh, Nicholas Bostrom, I think, idea that he talked about 100 years ago on Econ Talk uh, in, in one of the first episodes we ever did on um, – on uh, AI and artificial intelligence. But how do you think, assuming humans do know this, which there's a lot of evidence that not all humans uh, know this, meaning there are cruel humans and there are humans who work to serve nefarious purposes. Um, those of us who do feel that way, where does that come from in your mind? I think some of it's inborn. I, I, I study babies for a living, and, and I think there's some evidence of some degree of compassion and kindness, as well as some ability to use intelligence to, to reason about it, where, you know, it's bred in the bone. But then, plainly, culture, education, parenthood, parenting shapes it. There's all sorts of moral insights that have come up through, that are unique through culture. And, um, like, you know, you and I believe slavery is wrong. But, you know, that, that, that's pretty new. Nobody, nobody's born knowing that, um, you know, thousands of years ago, nobody believed that we, we believe, might believe racism is wrong. Um, and there, there's new moral insights, insights, um, that have to be nurtured. And then 
I didn't come up with this myself. I had to learn it. And, um, and similarly for, um, for AIs, they'll have to be enculturated in some way. Share intelligence won't, won't, um, bring us there. I, I will say one thing, by the way, about which, and, and I don't want to, we don't want to drift too much to other topics, but I do think that a lot of the very worst things that people do are themselves motivated by morality. Um, it's not, I, I, like somebody like David Livingston Smith says, no, no, it shuts off. You dehumanize people. You don't think of people as people. There, there is, I think, such a thing as pure sadism, um, pure desire to hurt people for the sake of hurting them. But most of the things that we look at and we're totally appalled and shocked by are done by people who don't see themselves as, as villains, but rather he says, no, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. You know, I, I'm torturing these prisoners of war, but I'm not a monster. You don't understand. The stakes are so high. It's tough, but I'm doing it. I'm going to blow up this building, you know, and I, I, I don't want to hurt people, but, but I have higher moral goods. And morality is a tremendous force, both for what we reflectively view as good and reflectively view as evil. Yeah, well, I like this digression. I want to, let me um, expand a little bit. Uh, one of the most disturbing books I've never finished but it wasn't because it was disturbing and it wasn't because I, I, I didn't want to read it. I did want to read it, but I'm just telling, I'm, I'm just confessing I didn't finish it. But it's a book called Evil oh. and it's by Roy Baumeister. And it's a lovely book. Um, well, sort of. Uh, and one of the things, one of the themes of that book is exactly what you're saying, that the most vicious criminals that almost everyone would say did something horrific. Uh, they'd say put them in jail. And I'm not talking about political actors like uh, the world we're living in right now in October of – in December, excuse me, of 2023. Got October on my mind, October 7th. Um, feel not just justified in what they did, but feel proud of what they did. And I think there's a deep human need, a tribal need maybe, to feel that there is evil in the world that is not mine and unacceptable. It is unacceptable to imagine that the people that we see as evil don't see themselves that way. Yes, that's right. Because we, we want to see them as these mustache twirling um, sadists or, or wicked people. And the idea that they do not feel that way about themselves is deeply disturbing. That's why that book is disturbing, yeah. not disturbing, because of uh, its revelation of evil, which is quite interesting and painful. But, but the idea that evil people, people that we will often dismiss as evil, do not see themselves that way. We just sort of assume, well, of course they, of course they are. They, they must be. They must know that, but they don't. In fact, some, the opposite. They think of themselves as good. There's some classic work by Lee Ross. I think it's Lee Ross at Stanford where it's on, it's on negotiations. It's on getting people together who have a serious grade, you know, Palestinians and Israelis being a nice, a nice current example. And the sort of common sense, very nice way of thinking about it is once these people get to talk, they'll, they'll, they'll start to convert, they'll start to appreciate the other side. But actually, Ross finds it's often the opposite. So you're talking to somebody and you're explaining, look, this is what you've done to me. This is the problem. This is the evils that you've committed. And then to your horror, the other person says, nah, no, 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 you're to blame. I did. Well, everything I did was justified. And people, people find this incredibly upsetting. I think there's this naive view, which is, if only I could sit with my enemies and explain to them what happened, they would then say, oh my gosh, I've been evil. I didn't know that. I, yeah. You were totally right. But of course, they think the same of you. Yeah, <laughs> which is and, hard to understand because you're not evil. They that's right. are. That's right. It's, um, a simple, it's a simple perspective-taking problem that they have. You know, there is a... I think a version of this, which is somewhat true uh, in some settings, uh, it's a famous episode in World War I, and it's captured in a song by John McCutcheon. It's a song I've always loved, even though the sentiment of the song, I think, is somewhat uh, accurate and somewhat inaccurate. It's called Christmas in the Trenches, and it's about a Christmas Eve uh, in the trenches between England and France on one side and Germany on the other. And a, somehow a soccer ball gets produced and they play this 
rousing, clean game of soccer. Uh, and they, you know, exchange pictures of their children and their, their yeah. wives. And they realize, hey, you know, we're just, without the uniform, we're just human beings. And I think there's a part of us that wants to believe that deeply. And of course, there's another part. War One was a particularly foolish, tragically foolish war where seemingly nothing moral was at stake. And you know, I can imagine that soldiers could could relate to one another. And of course, soldiers are usually drafted. They're not choosing to try to slaughter their uh, their uh, nationals from another side. But yeah, there's a sort of um, a naivete about the human heart and at what's at stake in many, many wars and situations that if we just sat down, we realize we have the same values. A lot of times we don't have the same values. We're really different values. That That's problem number one. And problem number two is often those values conflict, say, about land yeah. in the case of the conflict here in, here in, in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, there's religious differences that are on top of that. So it's a particularly tough problem. Having said that, there are wonderful organizations here in Israel that try to bring Palestinian and Israeli children together. Uh, there's a choir, for example, that that brings them together to sing. I think those are good things. Uh, I think finding our shared humanity is a really great idea, but unfortunately, there are sometimes limits to what it can achieve. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think, and and this kind of gets us back to the to the theme of the New Yorker article, which is everyone's into alignment. Make our make our machines as moral as we are. And then, um, and then there's been some some naysayers, and one of them I particularly like is a uh, philosopher Eric Schwitz Gibble, who's a who's a very sharp philosopher. And he says, "What a what a humble goal, what a kind of dispiriting saddle. Make them as moral as we are. We're not so hot, you know. <laughs> everybody, uh, you know, all of this violence and cruelty we do, so much of it's motivated by morality. Why don't we give up alignment and make them more moral?" Use their super intelligence to to figure out moral issues, get them chugging away at these problems. So they come back and they say, "No, no, no, you're doing it wrong. You think this is good and this is bad. Nah, this is good and this is bad." And then we 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 listen to them. And um and I wouldn't have talked about it if I don't find I I I admire Eric's work. I think I think part of his logic is right. And my complaint isn't that he's wrong. My complaint is we would never abide by that. We would never abide by an AI who said, you know, oh, you want me to drive you to, you want me to drive you to the bar? I don't think so, pal, because you promised to help your kid with his math homework. You know, you want you want me to you you want me to set up this this military endeavor? You know, no, no, you're, you're on the wrong side. We're gonna I'm gonna make you surrender. Um, you know, what are you having for dinner? Well, it's not gonna be factory farm meat. We're actually gonna drive you there. And and even. And and for these cases, we say, no, 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 no. I, I think what I'm doing is right. I don't want my I don't want my tools to override me. I think we would never abide by such a situation. We want AIs aligned enough not to kill us, but uh, maybe other things like not to drive over pedestrians and not to be too racist or whatever. But beyond that, we just want them to be our tools. Well, race is a really good, I think, distinction that. I don't think I've read anywhere, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's out there. Uh, tools don't have morality, by the way. You know, my hammer is, uh, I can use it immorally on your yeah. thumb, <laughs> but my hammer does not decide one day to jump up and slam your thumb. Uh, and, and we'd have to train it not to do that because it's a tool. And as a tool, it's put in my hand. I buy it or I acquire it or I borrow it. And I use it as I see fit, as you say. My car, I expect to take me to the to the steakhouse for the factory farm food or to the bar to have a drink with my buddies instead of help my kid. And it's my tool. By definition, yeah. a tool means it does my bidding. It may do it imperfectly. It may not be a well-made hammer, but it does my bidding. The whole debate here, in some sense, is this fundamental question of whether it will not do one's bidding and therefore has to be inherently designed to be restrained from doing its own bidding, yeah. paper clips, or the bidding of a bad bidding, right? A bidding that a, a wicked person or a careless person would put upon it. Again, 
the idea of a hammer having to have some kind of announcement, just like a truck when it backs up beeps. If a hammer is about to be within a certain distance of a thumb, it would have to call out and warn the person to move their thumb. Uh, doesn't this, isn't that really the, the issue here? If, if it can't acquire a mind of its own, do we have to be afraid of it? We don't, uh, we don't, but of course, AI tools have something approximating a mind of its own. And then, and then the issues come up. I think the issues might even come up with simpler things. I, I was on Twitter, which I always just get enraged and get into other people's anger. And somebody was complaining about a car that apparently people were talking about cars. Why do cars go above the speed limit? The speed limit is the speed limit. Why? Just because mechanically you go above the speed limit, we should keep to the speed limit. And so, so why do we allow the machines? Why don't we have to just not go faster? Give it some latitude for passing and for an emergency, but do they have to go that fast? People are enraged. So people, of course, they, they give these fantasy things. Yes, but what if somebody was in trouble and I had to race there to save their, their lives? And but that's not what's upsetting them. They want to be able to drive their car as fast. They want to be able to choose to break the law. And, and I think if the comps came, and arrested them, they say, well, that's a fair, that's fair. That's your cops. I broke the law. But my car is not going to stop me. I don't want my tax preparation software to, to scan, to take the plans of my house and say, your home office isn't that big. <laughs> and it gets, and we see this right now. I know, I know, I know you use uh, chat GPT and there are all sorts of instructions that it will not follow. And my sense is it's compromise view, which is to some extent we say that's good. We say I don't I don't mind that GPT four won't give, tell me how to produce a deadly virus, and that's good. But there's all those sorts of things I don't want it to tell me not to write a story that's too unpleasant because the unpleasantness makes the world worse. It's none of its business. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, we had we had a version of that. Uh, and there are cars. I don't know whether they were you had to pay for this feature or whether some people wanted it imposed. But you know, it take your breath, do a breath analysis, yes. and, and it wouldn't start if you were drunk. Yes. And and there's a piece of me, the classical liberal side of me, says that I should be allowed to choose that feature for myself if I want. But there's something disturbing about the state uh, imposing that. The same with the speed limit. You know, the idea would be uh, it, it would know how fast your car, your car knows how fast it's going. It's most of the time pretty accurate. And it would just have a, I forget the name of it. There's a name for it that keeps you from going faster than that. Yeah. Than that amount. Um, I we do that, I suspect. I'm sure we could find some examples where we do that happily. Uh, I can't think of them right off, but. I think it's fully compatible to say we shouldn't drive past the speed limit, but we uh, we do not want a machine to force us not to. That that we we value our autonomy more than our morality in this case. And um, and moral AIs have the potential of stripping away our autonomy. There's a certain dystopia you could imagine. And maybe we're not that far from it. This isn't as wacky as existential risk, where we all have AI plugged into everything. And the AI is this endless nanny state wired in where, you know, where you say something rude to me over Zoom and it cuts it out and replaces it with something more polite. Um, where, where, you know. It may have where, done that just now. Who knows? <laughs> you, you, who knows what you're, what you're trying to say and it gets all translated. Um, you know, where, where I have my tax software and it's all linked up to all this information about myself. So it just puts in honest stuff. And, you know, um, there's certain points where you say that might be legitimate. I don't, I wouldn't mind a hammer that wouldn't let you bash people's heads in with it. But I don't, I don't want a hammer that won't that won't let me pick it up, you know, when I'm supposed to be preparing my lectures. Or, in a moment of frustration, let you push it, put a ticket, and swing it through one of your own walls, not someone else's wall. That's right. So you say, yeah, maybe it's not so far away. Uh, you can think of sort of. I, 
and maybe two different ways you get to that world, uh, both somewhat alarming to me. The first is a top-down governmental um, social credit score that, you know, people talk yeah. about China imposing, you know, you jaywalked or you cut off someone in traffic or you were rude uh, or too brusque with someone who who needed your comfort and you get knocked down a few points and then you don't get into college. Yeah. Uh, I think those of us in the West find that frightening. Um, and then, and and I think, I think it's important to think about why it's writing it. There is some reduction of autonomy there. There's a certain combination nanny state and uh, big brother that's that's frightening. But there's also, I think, um, you you could we could make that a moral we could make a moral case for social credit scores that were flawed and uh, a benign dictator. There aren't any, but let's pretend for a minute a benign dictator would 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 have that kind of leverage over its, the citizens of the country, maybe, that would be, would make it a better place. And I, that human urge, uh, that utopian urge, which of course is often turns into dystopia, but if we take it at its purest level, that we want to use our tools to make the world a better place, then turns to the second kind of uh, abuse of these kind of tools where like you say, you know, it's it's sold, this, this driverless car is sold that it will not take you to a, a meat restaurant, say, because yeah. meat eating is immoral. And we could make a long list of, of things. Nothing doesn't have to be as subtle as, uh, you know, skipping out on your kid's homework session. A set of social causes that uh, this is the side. You, know, you want to go to a football game? Football is bad for human beings. It, it leads to brain injuries. Should we go into a, an ultimate Frisbee match? I'll take you there, but, or I'll stay in the driveway, your choice. And, and then I'll, they, I'll, park a, I'll park half a mile away because you have not been walking very much. And yeah, you, you know, you want to be a bit healthy. Exactly. Even better, right? No, that's even perfect. We, we, when you sat in the seat, we registered <laughs> that you are 2.3 kilograms above, uh, yeah. the uh, BMI index you should be at. And, uh, I won't, I'll, I'll take you to where you want to go, but not exactly all the way. <laughs> yeah. So why, why is there, now I'm way off track, but I don't care. Why is there this human urge to have such tools and impose them on others? Right. I, I mean, I, I love your going off track because it, it made me think for a bit that the AI problem I was concerned about is just the manifestation of another issue we always fight about, which is the, the tension between morality and freedom. So again, getting a bit current, you, you take the case um, where people are saying all sorts of really ugly anti-Semitic stuff on universities and so on. And there's an impulse, say, well, this is terrible stuff. We should stop people from doing it. We should, you know, we should arrest them. And in many countries, they have that kind of model when they have certain speech. Same with blasphemous speech, very offensive. Um, same with speech that, that targets out, you know, trans people or gay people. You know, we, we don't like that. We should stop it. And then there's another movement that says, maybe we don't like it, but we should give people autonomy to do things. And in part, this is based on humility, because we could be wrong. Maybe they, maybe the anti-Semites are right, and we are, we are blind, and they, they could be right. And then it's humility, but it's also respect. Res give people a respect to be within certain limits wrong and even hateful. So you have that debate, which is played out all the time. I think we're reliving this when it comes to how much power we want to have for AI, where, um, where we there's an impulse to stop AI from allowing us to do bad things. And you could really imagine, chat GPT already has tons of that. There's all sorts of instructions that won't follow. And I'm not talking about causing a deadly pandemic. I'm saying write a, a hateful message. It won't do it now. Um, and the same impulse, the censorship impulse, but I, but I don't want to put it in a bad way, says, good, and make the world better. Strip the world from this hate and this nastiness. And then the more libertarian impulse says, we might be wrong in any way people have a right. And so it, it occurs to me that the same issues that we're living at right now regarding personal freedom 
and this isn't just speech, it's everything from seatbelts to playing football, will come back again as AI becomes more and more of a tool that could constrain what we what we want to do. And to answer your question, we 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 have at least many, but we have two impulses. One impulse is we want to make the world a moral place. We want to act good. We want we certainly want others to act act good. I I don't I don't like when people say terrible things to each other. I don't like when people foment hate. That's the morality part of it. And then there's the freedom part of it. And I think there we find a lot of variations. I think some effective altruists would rank freedom as a zero. It doesn't, unless it makes people happy, it doesn't have any intrinsic value. Other people say it's, 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 it's absolute core to being a person and deserves enormous priority. Is that, is that how you would see it playing out? Well, I think there's another piece to it. Um, I've always thought of it this way and I don't, maybe it's not fruitful. I like it. Get your reaction. You know, we're born dependent. We come out of the womb. We can't feed ourselves. We can't walk. We're totally helpless. And if you have children, what you watch is the birth of autonomy. Yeah. You, you, you watch uh, the birth of mine, the phrase mine, meaning I, that I, I will have that, whether it's uh, a banana or a, uh, a stuffed animal belonging to a sibling, <laughs> or whatever it is. We have this powerful urge for independence and autonomy. And then if you're a, a parent, you also... I, 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 heard, I heard a story of... Two, I, I heard... A, I got, I got, I'll interject, sorry. I heard a story of two toddlers sitting in back who were fear, fighting as they do in cars. And the parents said, you know, there's a line between the seats. Uh, you each have domain over your own half of the car. And then one kid threw an utter tantrum because his brother was looking out his side of the window. <laughs> so, so yeah, just to expand on your point. Well, that's a perfect example of, uh, you know, you're free to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't interfere with my, with my life, unless I don't like what you're reading. <laughs> yes. In which case, is that a negative externality in the, in the language of economists? Anyway, so, so kids, as, as a parent, you watch your child uh, grow uh, independently of you and take on attitudes, activities, et cetera. And, and sometimes you restrict those because you think they're not safe. And the child often rebels against those restrictions. Uh, and that continues into adulthood. Uh, as adults, we don't like other people to tell us where we can drive our cars, for example. At the same time, I think there is this other impulse uh, that is not moral an authoritarian impulse. And I think it comes from parenting, right? We're all, uh, we're all children and many of us are parents. And when you are a parent for a long time, you do run the life of your infant child and then your toddler child and even your pre-adolescent child. And when they get into adolescence, all of a sudden this conflict becomes quite clear. And the child wants to express its own autonomy and independence. And you often, I think we're a little bit hardwired to, to want our children to do what we want. Yeah. And we tell ourselves it's because it's for their own good. But I always wonder whether that's always the case. And then when we move into the adult world uh, and we have the political frame and the political uh, issues that we're talking about of, of paternalism, nanny state and so on, I'm not convinced that that the nanny state is merely motivated by the fact that I want you not to smoke because I know what's best for you. I think some of it is I want you not to smoke because I want you to do what I want. And I think the authoritarian impulse is a very unhealthy and destructive one, but I think it's in there. No, I think that that's right. I, I, I was considering a sort of binary distinction between the autonomy you're talking about and the morality is issues. And, and as a good parent, that's what the kid struggles with. You want to give the kids some freedom, but no, he can't play in traffic because, yeah. you know, it's too dangerous. And that's, that's, and that's an easy case, but there are hard cases. You know, he wants, you know, you, you have an 11 year old and he wants to puff on a cigarette to see what it's like. I don't know. Like, okay, maybe do it and get sick and see what happens. And, but it, and these are complicated. 
But there's a third ingredient, which is the, the there's comes under a million names an authoritarian ur, urge, urge to power. Um, and I think we get a satisfaction out of controlling people. Yeah. I think bad parents have way too much of it because they have tremendous control over a helpless being and they, and they abuse it. Not necessarily sadistically, but somewhat arbitrarily. Um, it's still, you know, you have to do it because I, because I want it to be done. And we like having that control over other people. And you're right. This is, this is the sort of a libertarian complaint, which is, you know, this, a line from, uh, from Ronald Reagan saying the most scariest words in English language are, we're from the government. We're here to help you. Yeah. And, and the reason is, is this conscience, they don't really want to help you. They're, they're, they, they, they have their own goals and their own desires. And yeah. The thought, I, I, I take seriously the idea that some of what goes on in, say, the moralistic world of, of, of speech, for instance, isn't merely um, that I think the speech you're doing is harmful and should be stopped. It's also, I kind of get a pleasure from telling you, you can't say things. That's yeah. not a lot of power for me to have over another person. And we're primates. And it's an ugly part of ourselves, but being able to dominate people, getting me able to get them to do what you want them to do is, 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 is kind of heavy stuff. And that gives us a sort of rush. Yeah. And, you know, um, Henry Kissinger passed away recently. I think he's the man who said power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. Um, he, I think he's onto something there. Uh, I'm going to bring in a different theme. Uh, I think a lot about John Gray, um, it, it, the interview I did with him, and we'll link to it. And I think it highlights a point in your essay that maybe we'll come back to your essay now, Paul, uh, about how morality differs so much across culture. So John Gray's point is that he has more than one, but the one I'm thinking of is that we're children, of, we who are children of the West who are the result of the so-called Judeo-Christian values, have a, um, a utopian impulse that comes from Jewish and Christian sources, a messianic impulse, an impulse toward the end of days, an impulse toward uh, perfecting the human experience, an impulse toward redemption of the world. And I think the tech world and its embrace or unease with AI is related to that Judeo-Christian morality uh, that, you know, and I mentioned earlier, why is it that we care what other people do, that they're moral, or we think that they're doing the wrong thing? Sometimes it's because it hurts us. But a lot of times I think it's because of that Judeo-Christian culture, we, the water we swim in without even realizing it, yeah. uh, that our culture takes as a given that's almost never talked about that the world is improving and that we are heading toward a destination. If you're a believer, you think it's the second coming or in the Jewish perspective, the coming of the Messiah for the first time. If you're a secular person, it's the technology will improve us to the point. And in fact, maybe become perfected through human action to create a superior being that would not suffer from the moral failings that we human beings have that you, you alluded to earlier. What do you think of that? Um, I think Gray's diagnosis might be true. And I don't buy on to the, the second part of it, that we're, we are heading towards something, some sort of <clears throat> perfection. But I do, I do, I, I will endorse the first part, which I think, which I, I'm, I'm well aware he disagrees with and, and, and mocks, which is, I do think we've been getting better. I've been, persuaded by people like Steven Pinker and Peter Singer, Robert Wright, that 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 we are getting better. I'm I'm much happier. I'm much happier as as a Jew to be living now than, than living in Egypt at any other time in history. I'm much happier I, I if I if I were gay, if I were trans, if I were a woman, if I was this is just on average better times. And this leads me um to talk regarding the cross-cultural variation, which is I'm a moral realist. So if you ask ChatGPT, what does it think of two men getting married and holding hands? It says, it's fine. 
And he asked him, what do you think of killing these people for doing this? It's, it's terrible. I say, good, you are now aligned with my values. Um, I'm aware that many people in the world, and I don't know if it's the most people, many people in the world would view those as disgusting and immoral claims. They say, you have, your GPT has failed the morality test. They, it should know that it's disgusting and horrible and destroys humanity to have, to have gay men being together. And my stance on this is, well, if this happens to be a way in which my side has it right, you, your side has it wrong. And it's very hard to argue such things, to make such moral arguments. But I think it is tied with progress. I think a world which has these sort of liberal enlightenment values will in the long run do better, better for people, better for everybody than a world that views homosexuality as punishable by death. <laughs> that was a lot. I'll let you respond to that. No, that's all right. Uh, we've probably had this conversation before, and I'm I'm always happy to revisit it because I haven't fully um, – I'm uneasy with my position. I can defend it. I have a viewpoint um, that I want to hold, but I, I I know that there's a nagging unease with my viewpoint. Uh, with my viewpoint being that it's I'm more John Gray than than you are, I think, and more John Gray than Stephen Pinker. That I think a lot of the progress we've made, we made progress in some things and not so much in others, um, and some of this progress has come at a cost. Uh, some of the attitudes that yield the outcomes we like maybe have other consequences that are not so straightforward. Uh, you say you're, you'd rather be a Jew now than any other time in human history. Uh, not on October 7th in Kibbutzberry no. or at the Nova Music Festival. So you no, have that's... to take, you have to take, and you know, the Holocaust. When, when I, and when we've talked about this before, I think I probably say, well, what about the 20th century? And I think the attitude of, of Pinker and others is, well, we made some mistakes in the 20th century, but now we know those things are wrong. And you could argue that fewer and fewer people think it's okay to kill Jews, say, for example. Uh, but I'm not sure fair, that's what, true. What at least <laughs> Pinker would say about the 20th century is <clears throat> absolutely horrific, terrible, terrible, terrible. Sure. Until you compare it to the 19th century. And that really sucked. Yeah, I think he's wrong. <laughs> I think I, I'm not sure. The 20th century is a materially much more pleasant place than the 19th. And that leads to many, there are many, many good things that come from that material uh, bounty, which I, I concede. But but the human heart hasn't changed. And the question is, is there cultural evolution that uh, comforts us? In other words, the attitudes you're talking about, the changes on average, many of them are very positive. Uh, and so should we say that, that that's enough? Uh, I certainly can see the material progress, obviously, as an economist, uh, written about it and, and championed it. Uh, it's only in my later years that I've wondered whether the other parts of the human experience uh, have, have not advanced nearly as much or, in fact, have become worse, thinking about despair, a sense of meaning, a sense of belonging. Um, you know, I... I'm sitting here in Israel in December of 2023. Uh, there are many dark days here, but there's also a tremendous amount of, of purposefulness and solidarity and unity and love uh, as this country tries to cope with the aftermath of October 7th. Forget whether you agree with the military response, just the social response of the country to help people who struggled through what has happened is 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 very uh uplifting uh and and that also is part of the story of course of uh, there's the dark side of the human heart and there's the bright side and uh I, I at least for now tend to think there's both and i don't really i'm not so confident that either side has changed much relative to the past but um i i agree i, I like the line that the human heart hasn't changed <clears throat> i think that that's true um I am against slavery, and that is a good thing. But me, the same person, if I was raised in a different time, I would be entirely in favor of slavery and benefit from it. And nothing of my fundamental human character has changed. It's just culture has changed in the same way that I'm more scientifically informed in an earlier version of myself without being any smarter. I've just been lucky enough to, to sort of get the accumulation of history. I guess what I'm curious, I, I have my guesses, but but... You've, you, you agree that things have gotten a lot better and you agree that things have, in some ways, or maybe our basic character have changed to stay the same. 
I'm curious what you think has gone worse over the last thousand years. And, and I guess I would guess it would be a certain secularization and some stuff that's lost through it. No, um, not necessarily, actually. Uh, I, I want to... I, I want to add to your point about slavery, though. Uh, I want to actually reinforce it and, and and go against my my claim. I think it's it's more powerful than than you make it. Not only do we believe um, that slavery is wrong, the people in the past it's not just that we think that it's wrong. The people in the past who were slave owners, and we did a wonderful uh, episode with Mike Munger on this. Um, we'll link to. It's not. It wasn't that they were slave owners and thought, well, I can do this because I'm more powerful. I have the guns. Yeah. They actually thought they were doing something good. So the, the revulsion against slavery isn't just people used to do that because they could, and now they know it's wrong. And now they don't because they think it's wrong. They thought it was right before. It's, yeah. really, it, it, it's a... It's a um, uh, I didn't say that very well, but I think you know what I meant. Yeah. So I, I concede that for sure. Um, and I think uh, that's a very, um, that's not unimportant and it's very important. And I think we made progress in our attitudes towards many things. I think what I have trouble with, it's not the secularization, although I am, you know, I am religious, but that's not, um, I think many people find meaning from lots of things besides belief in God or communal prayer or a thousand other things. I think what I see around me that I find troubling is a rising suicide rate among young people in the West that I think is a fact. Sometimes these kind of so-called facts are statistical artifacts on the way data are gathered, but I think it's true. I think there's a, a, a much smaller feeling of belonging. Uh, and I think as human beings, our connections... I understand there are people out there don't who are introverts and don't need to connect to other human beings as much as others. But for many human beings, connection and a feeling of belonging and a feeling of purpose are very, very important. And I think many of those things have been lost, maybe because of uh, the death of religion in many, in many circles, but I don't think that's all of it. And what worries me as a free market capitalist sort is, and this is the closest I'll come to a, something vaguely anti-capitalist, I, I worry that our culture uh, has made the despair and and lack of connection and lack of purpose uh, part a, a, is, as a consequence. I worry about that. I, I, I'm skeptical of it, but I worry about it. And But I do think the underlying problem is real. I don't Another way I'd say it, uh, the country I used to live in and love, the United States, seems to be pulling itself apart, as is meant much of the West. Um, that doesn't seem good. I, I don't see I see a lot of dysfunctional uh, aspects of life in in, in the, the modern world. Do, am I being too pessimistic? Am I just an old person now? Well, you're you're asking the wrong guy. To ask a young person. Um, <laughs> you no, so I, 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 I have some, I have some, I have sympathy for that. And I was, I, I was reading something about Donald Trump the other day, and I, I turned to my wife and said, "Are these the end of days?" Because you know, between between AI and what's happening in your little part of the world, and the fact that the next ele American election has a reasonably high probability of having somebody refuse to concede and throw the country into some sort of tumult. It seems like difficult times. I guess I have two thoughts. One thing I, I agree with, I think, I think that within a period of years, you could say suicide rates have gone up, depression rates have gone up, deaths of despair, um, that sort of argument. Um, and I think there will always be these ebbs and flows. But I'm more interested, so maybe I asked the question poorly, do you think there's been an overall decline over the span of hundreds or thousands of years? So this is this is the sort of the Steve Pinker claim is that on average, in the long run, we humans flourish more, we treat each other better, and so on. At least over the span of like a few uh, of hundreds of years, 
And yeah, that's, I, compa- that's compatible with saying, man, the last decade has been a train wreck. Right. And I, and I do think, of course, you don't want to overweight re- through recency bias, uh, say the last 10 years or the last 20. Um, and I think one way to put your question uh, that brings it into stark uh, relief with the alternatives is where, when would you want to be born? Yeah. Would you want to be born in the year 1000 with um, uh, no dentists, <laughs> um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I, so in that sense, I think, I think Stephen Pinker's wrong about the violence part. I think his data on the violence, I'm, I'm, I'm a Nassib Nicholas Taleb uh, fan on this. I think his presumption that the decline in deaths over time is not persuasive. Uh, as Talib would point out or others, you know, okay. one nuclear mistake will make all that look really bad. But I think the more interesting question is the one that you raise, which is, do we treat each other better? And um, I think there's a lot of evidence that we do treat each other better. And it's not just women, blacks, gays, Jews, you know, the 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 obvious cases. I wonder if people just treat their children more politely. Yeah. Do they, and more humanely, uh, as corporal punishment declines? Do they treat their buddies more thoughtfully? I like to think they do. Is it true? You know, I, I, I conceded gladly that the material well-being of the modern era brings lots of benefits beyond just uh, toys. Um, are we more moral in how we treat each other without the tribal issues of skin color, race, religion, and so on? I don't know. It's an it, interesting it, question. It, I mean, it, it, one, it feels like we do. I think I might concede that. If, if I had to pick up one thing that goes against my side, you might say that the notions of hospitality to strangers have faded. Mm. It used to be at least reading over like ancient texts and so on in the Bible. It used to be a big thing. Somebody comes from another town and you really have to take care of them. You have this obligation to take care of them, to feed them, to treat them with respect. And that is something I feel that we've lost as we've gotten into much bigger societies. I think there are things that we've lost. Um, still arguing against my side, I think there are people who miss the sort of smaller communities with all of their costs and benefits. You know, the cost being, you know, savage gossip, enormous social control, but the benefits being nobody gets lost. Yeah. Yeah, I think about that when I think about the homeless problem in America. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I don't believe people should be locked up for mental illness. Uh, And at the same time, the fact that many of the people on America's streets are have serious mental problems, addiction problems, and we walk by them. I mean, I. I used to give them a dollar uh, in the good old days when I lived there, um, as long as there weren't too many of them. I don't know what I do now in some situations, but so, there's something very beautiful about the fact that we allow them to live in the way that they choose to live. We don't arrest them. We don't lock them up and put them in an insane asylum, what used to be called an insane asylum, which is a horrible yeah. place. At the same time, nobody cares enough about them to take care of them, help them. Um, many try. Uh-huh. And it's a beautiful thing, but uh, you, when you see the the uh, tent encampments in American cities these days, yeah, I, I don't go, I don't, res, I don't exult in the freedom of the individual there. I I feel great sadness. I don't have a simple solution for it either, by the way. I don't because uh, I don't want to lock lock them up again. But um, and and people debate over how much of it is mental illness versus other economic pressures, but. Uh, Something doesn't seem quite healthy there. In the college campuses, the, the, the loss of, of honest discourse, the fear of saying something wrong that you'll be judged for, something's gone wrong there. These are trivial things compared to slavery. I can see that immediately. So um, I think that the other issue that, that needs thinking about is that, you know, I have no problem conceding that, that economic freedom writ large has, has helped change the standard of living of humanity by the billions. Um, I, and that's a good thing. I don't have any problem with the idea that there's cultural evolution 
And that's a good thing uh, that much of it's been productive and means people lead more pleasant lives. I think the, the question is whether, you know, the so-called enlightenment project in and of itself is the source of all that. And, and I think that's a more complicated yeah. question. I think that is. And then there's also the question of whether the Enlightenment project is coming to an end. I think that I'm always shocked. You mentioned age. I'm always shocked an extent to the, which in life issues, at least in the United States, but I think worldwide, the difference between people say over 40 and under 30 in all sorts of things. In, 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 in the, in the Middle East issue, for instance, um, in America, people over 40 are pretty staunchly pro-Israel. People, people below 30 are pretty staunchly pro-Palestinian. Correct. And, it says it's, it's, and it's not a sort of subtle, it's really a thing. Maybe related to this, but there was some poll saying a lot of young people in America have no idea the Holocaust has happened. It's just not, it's just not part of our historical training. What something you and I probably had as our like bread and butter, like this, this yeah. is the world we live in, is no longer present for Jews either. Um, I know very few people of my age who identify as non-binary, but, but when you get below 30, you get, you get not a majority, an enormous amount of people, uh, issue traditional gender categories. Um, attitudes about free speech have a similar diagnostic and, you know, and the people say that the young people are going to become, you know, they're going to rule the world. And, um, and if it continues in this trajectory, it's going to be a very different world than the world that, that you and I ruled. And, yeah. you know, and I, and I could, I could say, well, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to want, you know, things change. I want to watch this, but I feel, I feel personally sad that certain virtues, like the virtues of open discourse and free speech superseding people's comfort sometimes, that that is going to become just an old fashioned view as, as you know, they will view that as they viewed people who were sympathetic to, to, you know, restricting women to vote. I don't think it's like factory farm meat, though. I mean, I don't, no. um, I, there are consequences. If, if it came to be the view that, that factory farm meat was evil, and many people hold that view. I do. And the world ate less factory farm meat, which meant that fewer cows were raised, and maybe none. Uh, that you could debate whether that be good for the cows or not um, in the short and long run. But that is very different, I think, than giving up on free speech. As you say, the Enlightenment Project might be coming to an end. And that's a very different thing than people having different preferences than you and I have. Yes. And I think a lot of it, by the way, and I'm really going to show my age, uh, a lot of it is um, when, when people say that, well, young people will become older and then they'll be more like old people. Not if they don't marry and not if they don't have children. A lot of the reason that old people are the way they are, I think, it's a speculation, it's because they've gone through the uh, the cauldron, not the cauldron, I don't know what the right word is, the, the, uh, the anyway, the, the experience of, of marriage and children, which um, broadens you in certain ways and changes your preferences in other ways. And it's... Um, this generation, the, the under 30s that you're talking about, many fewer of them are married. It's not the yeah. only reason they're not like you and me, but many fewer are married, many fewer have children than, than in the past. And that's going to change the world we live in in all kinds of interesting ways that might be interesting to watch or sometimes painful. Uh, the other thing I think about is, um, is this, the smartphone, um, which when I look back to my old blog posts when I used to blog, Back in, say, 2007, um, you know, I used to romanticize the smartphone with, with great, uh, great eloquence, of course. I don't know if it was eloquence or not, but I thought it was such an extraordinary triumph of human ingenuity and creativity. I still do. But its social impact is quite complicated, <laughs> and um, I'm not sure it's good. I'm not, sure it's, I'm not sure it's good either. I, I, I don't have a settled view. I know, like, John Haidt, my friend John Haidt, has very strong yeah. views about it. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of debate, and a lot of debate happens is around whether the social pathologies that get associated with smartphone are they worldwide as the smartphone is, or are they only in some countries and not others? And that's how how you would argue it. But just on a gut level, it can't help but transform us in that for the most part we're never alone and we're never bored. And and I love it. You know, I I go on a streetcar to work every day and. 
you know, I'm listening to a podcast. Um, I'm often listening to your podcast while I'm, do, while I'm doing it. And I'm also playing the spelling bee because the podcast isn't enough. God forbid to do part of my mind that's free to wander. And then okay, I also check my email for text because what if, you know, if, and I, if I didn't if it reveal preferences, if I didn't love it, I wouldn't do it. But I could recognize in the long run, I am not the kind of person who, who they, they were making a hundred years ago. I, I, you know, I, I'm not, I, I couldn't go into the woods for a long period of time and be happy. I couldn't, um, I, I think I've lost a little bit of the ability of my mind to make up its own entertainments. Yeah. I will say, however, it's not inevitable. My, my older son, um, don't want to embarrass him, I won't, won't mention it by name, but, but um, in the midst of all of this, as a late teenager, he said, I'm going to take the summer, part of my summer, and read Russian novels. He spent hours each day just sitting, reading Russian novels. He was, he was, he was undereducated in that way. And not online, doesn't agree like to things online. And he somehow stepped out of it. He's a perfectly modern guy, lives in a modern world. But, um, but you, you, there are people who, who don't have to be caught up in this. Yeah, there is a bit of a pendulum, right? There's a, it swings, there's a bit of a backlash. Yeah. Um, but I'm shocked at how little there is in my own life. <laughs> uh, I, I enjoy it so much in the short run. And the, the inability to not pull my phone out and, and check X, Y, or Z is, is, it depresses me a little bit. That's my problem. Not our, have, it's not I our a, problem. I have, a, I have a theory, which is it's people like you and me who are most vulnerable. Those who are raised with it develop a sort of immunity and so on. But those who, as adults, we started getting the full, and it's like, it's like we, we, we've gotten accustomed to cocaine too late in life to develop and it just swamped us and and now life without cocaine is unimaginable and so i wonder whether we are, we are we are hit the worst of it yeah digital cocaine it's like the parents who keep us keep their kids from eating sweet cereal and then exactly. when they once they leave the house it's uh cocoa puffs 24 7. <laughs> exactly uh, my guest today has been paul bloom uh paul thanks for being part of econ talk this has, as always, been great. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.